And so there's a, a saying that, you know, goes, you know, what do you call, <laughs> what do you call um, couples that use uh, the rhythm method? Parents. And so, <laughs> so the, the main difference between the rhythm method and fertility awareness is that... Lisa Hendrickson Jack, I am thrilled to welcome you to the Better Podcast today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, I reached out to you um, to come on the podcast because I thought I've been following your work for a while, and I, in in my opinion, in terms of what I've seen, in terms of educators, you are one of the best in the world. In terms of the way that you explain things, it's so relatable. And what we're talking about is actually quite a complex hormonal feedback loop and signs and symptoms in the body and how to be attuned with our female uh, cycles, particularly women who are in their reproductive years. So I really wanted to have you on the podcast and I'm really grateful that you accepted uh, my invite. So we're going to have a great conversation today, hopefully a masterclass, as I was saying to you in the pre-chat, a masterclass on menstruation and cervical mucus, because this is, <laughs> this is where you shine and we're just going to get right into it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Your words are very, very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So before, okay. So I want to talk about your, or I, obviously I want to understand how you got into the line of work that you have. But just before we do, I think that there is a need for a few definitions. So I want to, for the listener who has never heard of fertility awareness, who's never heard of charting, uh, or even like what the significance is of cervical mucus other than like dirtying your underwear. Um, let, let's start with, let's start with a definition of fertility, like what fertility awareness is. And in your definition, I'd love if you can also, uh, maybe contrast it with, you know, some other myths, uh, like I've, I've often heard it re referred to or compared to the rhythm method and it's not reliable and it's sort of been dismissed as like unscientific and all of those things. So I, I would love for you to first define fertility awareness methods, and then we can kind of get into some of the other ones as well. Sure. Well, fertility awareness in the general sense is uh, having an understanding of how your cycle works. And so there's no way to have an understanding of how your cycle works without understanding some of the myths that we've been taught about our, our bodies. And, you know, certainly one of the most common myths is that we can get pregnant every day of our cycles and there's no safe days. I was taught that in junior high and most women I know are also taught that. So um, from a very basic level, there's only from a scientific perspective, six days of the cycle where conception is possible. And the reason for that is so in a typical cycle, you have your period. And then you have, you go into your pre-ovulatory phase and you have a few days, what we fertility awareness folks call dry days before you start to see cervical fluid. So cervical fluid looks like creamy white hand lotion, or it can look like raw egg whites, kind of like that stretchy clear white stuff. Or sometimes you'll just notice that it's really slippery when you wipe yourself. And so we produce cervical fluid for several days before ovulation in response response to hormones. So as we produce more estrogen, estrogen is what stimulates that. Um, and that leads up to ovulation. We care about cervical fluid because when we're making it, it changes the pH and environment in our vaginas and it makes our, it makes us very sperm friendly. So it's like a home away from home, if you will. And so while we're producing the cervical fluid, the sperm can survive in there up to five days. And I think a lot of women have heard, okay, sperm can survive in your body for five days, but it's usually kind of, they don't tell you why or when. So, so you may just think that it's just all the time. Right. Uh, so long story short, when we're going through the menstrual cycle, you're only fertile on those days as you approach ovulation because the sperm can survive in your cervical fluid. That is called your fertile window. And once you ovulate, there are physiological signs that you can measure, which we'll talk about. So there's cervical fluid, basal body temperature, cervical position. Um, there's also ways to test hormones. So there's different methods that do different things. Uh, but essentially, once you ovulate, it closes the door. The window is closed and you cannot, you, once you've confirmed that through, you know, scientific ways, <laughs> you cannot conceive for the remainder of your cycle. So there is a point in your cycle where you can have unprotected sex and not get pregnant because there's only this small fertile window. So back to the original question of what is fertility awareness in the most general sense, it's understanding that and being able to track and monitor those signs so that you can know when in your cycle, you're actually fertile and when you're not. 
Uh, now, the fertility awareness method. So one of the things I always share is that there's no one fertility awareness method, you know, air quotes, there's multiple fertility awareness based methods. So if this is the first time that you're hearing of it, uh, it's it's a thing. And there are plenty of organizations that teach women how to track this. And there's plenty of different ways to do this. And so if you've heard about the rhythm method, which you asked about, so it's an actual method, and it's based on calendar calculation. So uh, essentially, you would track a certain number of cycles and calculate when you ovulated, and then you would use that calculation to identify when you're fertile. And so there's a, a saying that, you know, goes, you know, what do you call, <laughs> what do you call um, couples that use uh, the rhythm method, parents, <laughs> and so, so the, the main difference between the rhythm method and fertility awareness is that the rhythm method is based on guessing and, and checking. So it's basically you come up with this calculation and then you assume that you can predict when you're going to ovulate. Fertility awareness is different because it's based on the bio, biology of the female body, how it actually works. So you're not guessing, you're not estimating. And what you're doing is, you know, each day of your cycle, you're actually checking your signs, uh, you know, after you learn them and learn how to do it and identifying which days are fertile. So at the end of each day, is it fertile based on what I saw today? Um, another difference is that we do have science behind it. So one of the most commonly cited peer reviewed papers actually studied women who were trained to chart their cycles. And as a method of birth control, it has been shown to be up to 99.4% effective when used correctly. So the key though, is that the women in that study were trained in a specific method and they were using it correctly. And so because we have so many different ideas of what is charting and what is fertility awareness, certainly the, um, the user effectiveness can vary quite a bit. Uh, but I think what's helpful to know, especially because I'm a you know educator and teacher, when you're working with a certified instructor, you can achieve, you know, a high efficacy that that uh, rivals that of hormonal contraceptives. So what is so you mentioned charting? So let's actually let's actually define that for our listeners as well. What is charting? Is there is there equipment needed? Do we how long do we need to chart in order to attain that ninety nine point four uh, efficacy rate? What are some of the you know things that we learn through charting? Well, so charting is just the word that refers to tracking your um, your fertile signs. So, uh, you know, in terms of equipment, so when I first started like 20 years ago, there were no apps or smartphones. Like my phone was green and that was about it. All it could do is text. Uh, so back in the day, you would get, you know, the to a spreadsheet, you know, print it out and track it. Um, and so you're literally noting uh, you know, most fertility awareness based methods are using a combination of the three main signs, which I mentioned are mucus, basal body temperature and cervical position. So, you know, you check for your cervical fluid each day. There's different ways to do that. You take your temperature in the morning before you get out of bed and you can write it on a paper chart. Now there's hundreds, if not thousands of uh, period tracker apps and various fertility awareness charting apps. So it's really easy because you can just enter the information to your app and it gives you an actual chart. And um, certainly there's a lot of devices now that help you take your temperature and, and sync the phone of, of different ways to do it. And so just to kind of, we, we talked briefly about cervical fluid. I know you want to get into it a little bit more, so I'll kind of save that. But for basal body temperature, for anyone who hasn't heard of it, it's really cool. It's, I, I remember for me when I first started charting, um, so I learned, I, best, I heard this woman talk about it. I was at this talk, this woman was like reading from her book, you know, this author, and I was in university and it was like my, I call it my post high school feminist phase, you know, we had a women's center. And so anyways, if anyone's curious about how I got, got into all of this, but anyway, so this woman was talking about how you can know when you're fertile in your cycle by watching your cervical fluid, your um, cervical position and the temperature. And so if you take your temperature every morning before you get out of bed, it's actually measuring your metabolism. And what's really interesting is that when you are approaching ovulation, you're making lots of estrogen, it's causing um, different changes in your cycle, it, it helps to build your uterine lining, you know, estrogen is indirectly directly related to the quality of your period, your menstruation. And so once you ovulate, that's the point in your cycle where you start producing progesterone. 
And so uh, you don't produce significant pro progesterone unless you ovulate. And what happens when you start, when you ovulate and you start making this progesterone, it actually has a thermogenic effect on the body. So it's a biological scientific thing that is measurable. So when you're taking your temperature every morning after ovulation, you actually see that the temperatures are higher. And if you're tracking it on like a graph, like a paper chart school, then you could actually take a ruler and draw a line between the post ovulatory higher temperature and the pre-ovulatory lower temperature. And you can think of it as a way that your body is actually preparing for pregnancy. So that elevated temperature um, is, is necessary, obviously, for this natural process of, um, of fertilization, you know, conception, um, all of those things. So uh, when I was first charting, it was really, I mean, because it's like you're your own science experiment. And it takes it away from, so I know, I think a lot of women can relate to this. When I was younger and I learned that, the, you know, my teachers told me that I could get pregnant every day, but they didn't tell me why. And I didn't understand what was happening. So when you learn to chart, essentially just the word for tracking these signs, you start to actually see, so you can know each day where you are in your cycle. You can be able to predict when you're going to have your period. So it'll never surprise you. And all of a sudden it's, you've lifted the veil and it's no longer a mystery what's happening. Right. And I think that that also correlates really well subjectively with what women feel in that luteal phase where we know that progesterone has a potent, is a potent stimulator of appetite. We get all the cravings in the luteal phase and we often, I'll often hear women say that their bowel movements will change. Sleep is like they're hotter. You know, they have a hard time falling asleep, staying asleep because they're, as you were mentioning, you know, they're a little bit warmer. So when we are sleeping, of course, one of the hallmarks of having good sleep is actually cooling down your core body temperature. That's what allows us to fall asleep. And when you have progesterone, um, you know, when she has that sustained sort of um, uh, secretion from the corpus luteum in the luteal phase, and that we can sort of also track that that with a patient's uh, or a woman's, you know, subjective uh, recall of whether she feels like if she if she's craving, you know, if she has any cravings, if her sleep is uh, disturbed. But I love that there's, uh, you know, that's more of a, you know, that that's more subjective. As I said, this is more an, of an objective measurement of what's actually happening, uh, which I love. And I also, it's it's. Um, I have to ask you, did you did you grow up in a Catholic school? <laughs> because I totally That's, did. I totally. I'm I, not Catholic, <laughs> but my parents sent me. So I'm Christian. Yeah. Um. So my parents sent me to Catholic school because they wanted me to learn about Jesus, right? Right. And so that I learned I, about I, probably everything, but same. And so I grew up the same as you, where I thought that if I went into a swimming pool, I could get pregnant. You know. That's and, basically what they tell you. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when I first started. Um, you know, wanting to have children and trying to have children, it was such a psychological shift for me because I had spent, you know, 28 years or maybe not 28, but, you know, from the time when I was a teenager to through to the time when I was 28 saying, okay, like I have to avoid pregnancy at all costs. And then for me to say, okay, now it's like time to open up, you know, open up shop. You know, it was such a change in my, in my mentality. I actually found it a little like very challenging because you have, you had spent, you know, decades thinking you could just get pregnant at any time. And then the first month that we were trying, I didn't get pregnant. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I can't, I, I can't believe, it. I mean, we were pregnant in the second month of trying, but the first month I was like, oh my God, like, how hard is this going to be? And you have all these worries and all these, um, you know, thoughts that go through your head around, you know, what have I been worried so much about for so long? Well, and that's something I, I talk about a lot in a lot of different ways. It's hard, you know, in, in some ways to talk about fertility awareness without, you know, contraceptives, hormonal contraceptives coming up, the topic of that. Right. And so what I found in, in my practice, so when you chart your cycles with fertility awareness, so it, it, it requires for most women a pretty huge shift in their thinking, going from exactly what you said to, to believing that you could get pregnant if your partner looks at you <laughs> intently, uh, to understanding that there are parts of your cycle where it's physiologically impossible, biologically impossible. Um, so even, and what I find as well, because I teach this is that even if you read the stuff and you understand the science, it, you, it's, you still have to overcome the mental hurdle. So I have clients that are petrified, even though they know the science and they've been charting and they can understand when in their cycle 
people can't concede. And it's really only when they get a, uh, to, to try to see if the method works for themselves and they don't get pregnant and then it happens again and again, you know, then they can really start to be like, wow. So it takes a lot of deprogramming. And one of the challenges I would say is that as women, then we're taught to fear our fertility, but we're not taught to understand it. And so I've had many conversations over the years with women who are in their, you know, early to mid thirties who are just as terrified of getting pregnant unexpectedly as they were when they were 19. And what's missing from that discussion isn't, I mean, pregnancy is possible in any cycle with ovulation. So it's not, I'm not saying that you, it's, you know, that, that that's not true. If you ovulate in a cycle and you have sex in your fertile window, pregnancy is always possible, but we don't really talk about how your chances of conception change with age. Right. And for most women is not something they consider. So they're managing their fertility at 35 in the same way that they were when they were 21. And um, one of the things you said is really important. So women go from being like a, I, so I talk about the intention scale a lot with my clients. And so you can think of it like zero to 10, like zero, meaning no babies, like all the birth control twice <laughs> and, and being I'm trying right now. And I am waiting to see the pregnancy test is doing handstands right. after sex. Three. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's like 18, I thought, cause I was zero, but I thought you were either a zero or a 10. I, I, I didn't get gray area when I was young until I started working with women and seeing what's really happening in the world. And a lot of us aren't there. But my point is that a woman can go from zero to 10 in one cycle. I mean, and this might seem strange, but think about it logically, right? Like if you are waiting until you get married to try, um, then like literally like the day you get married, you're okay with pregnancy now. <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> and it's so, so true. yeah, like literally like a magical line in the sand and all of a sudden you want a baby. And if you've been taught your whole life that you can get pregnant at the drop of a dime. So a lot of women then use hormonal contraceptives, right? Until the month that they're ready to try, they come off of it and assume that they're going to get pregnant right away. So whereas you emotionally have switched from a zero to a 10, um, you know, has anyone talked to you about the post pill transition phase that your body goes through that takes anywhere from, you know, nine to 12 cycles, 12 to 18 months, has anyone ever told you, right? And by the time you reach the second or third cycle, where, you know, you've tried and you didn't get pregnant, you're already freaking out, right. like fully freaking out. Right. So this is why it's important to talk about these things. And I also think that you're getting mixed messages. So someone like you is saying, listen, there's this, po and we've had a Dr. Jolene Brighton on the, on the show. And she talks about, you know, uh, the post birth control symptoms that you may experience, including infertility. Um, but when you go to maybe an allopathic, if you're going to your medical doctor, they're saying it's fine. Like, don't, you know, stay on the pill until, you know, you don't want to get pregnant before the before your wedding, you want to, you know, if that's, you know, something you've discussed with them, you, you get these, um, um, messages that are completely different. And I think it's really scary. And a woman is like, well, who am I supposed to listen to? Like, what, what is this? Um, so let's, let's touch a little bit on, um, Let's talk a little bit about what a normal menstrual cycle uh, should look like. And by cycle, I don't just mean bleed. I mean like cycle, like the 29, 30 days, whatever it is. Um, and then we can move into, I'd like to move into some of those subpopulations. So like, it, I'd love to talk about infertility and maybe we can talk on the, you know, the, the hormonal birth control and some of those methods as well. So your book, which I see in your background, uh, the fifth vital sign, there she is. <laughs> I mean, the book just says it all, right? Like the exactly. title is so perfect. Uh, I actually, I have, um, uh, when this, when this episode is released, my book will be out, but, um, the, we, I use that line because it's, you know, your, your menstrual menstrual sign, your menstrual cycle as a woman is your, I call it like your lasso of truth. Like there has to be a wonder woman reference in there for me. So I'm like, it's your lasso of truth, right? It's like, it's going to, it's your report card. So explain uh, to us why your menstrual cycle is a vital sign and why we should be paying attention to this irrespective of whether or not we want a baby. All right. Well, so, I mean, it's helpful, I think, a lot of times to define vital sign because we don't really think about it a lot and, unless we're actual active medical practitioners. And so a vital sign is a bodily response that monitors how everything is functioning. And so if you think about the most common vital signs, we've got heart rate, 
body temperature, respiratory rate. So how many breaths you take each minute and your blood pressure. And everybody knows that if you go to the doctor and they're going to measure your blood pressure, there is a range that it's supposed to fall into. And if the blood pressure is too high or too low, so if it's too high, there's specific things that doctors know, okay, like it could, so it doesn't give them a full diagnosis, but it gives them a specific roadmap, right? Because these are the things that can make the blood pressure too high, or these are the things that can make the blood pressure too low. And so when you're dealing with someone who is trained in understanding the menstrual cycle, as a vital sign, then it's, it's much the same way. So you asked, what is a normal menstrual cycle? So if I take you through the cycle, we can start with the period. Um, and I'll say that, you know, the myth is that the cycle has to be 28 days to be healthy. And if it's 20, you know, nine, or if it's 32, that's a problem. And so it's helpful to know that there is a range of cycle length. So generally speaking, 24 to 35 days, if it falls within that range. And so that's from the first day of your period, the first day of your true flow to the day before your next true flow. So there are plenty of women who have a bit of spotting before or after. So I'm talking about the first day of your true bleed. And so that um, time frame then about 24 to 35 days. And uh and so, you know, some would argue even that a functional range is a bit tighter, you know, maybe 27 to 30, 32 days, but ultimately 24 to 35 days. So that means that your cycle could be 33 days and it could be completely fine, but it also means that it could be 28 days and we could have some concerns. So if we start at the period, so a period uh, should last anywhere from about three to seven days. And with an average of, say, four to five days, it should start, you know, moderate to heavy and basically have a decrescendo pattern. So typically, you know, once it gets going, um, typically gradually, um, in terms of volume lightening, anyone who's had a period <laughs> would appreciate. Interestingly enough, you know, lose about 70 percent of the bleeding the second day 90 percent by the third day so it kind of makes sense if you've had that experience so the, the color should be a variant of red so that can be burgundy or like wine um, but it should be red um, some degree of spotting that may be brown or pink is within the, the realm of normal but if you're seeing spotting that is like black or like crushed dark blueberries or something like that, um, that is something that we should look out for and also extreme clotting or things of that nature um, is is not optimal or ideal and in terms of volume so um, anywhere from say like one to three or four ounces so like 25 milliliters up to 80 milliliters and obviously you know most women aren't necessarily measuring this but if you use a menstrual cup for example you know most cups represent about an ounce so throughout the entire time that you bleed, you should fill at least one of those. Or if you're using pads or tampons, that would be like, you know, five um, regular pads or tampons, you know, thereabouts, actually like filling them, air quotes, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. reasonably full. And then at the top end, 80 milliliters, I think that's helpful to know. I think it's helpful to know on both sides. Uh, many women, um, my experience has been in my classes that most of us, we just think, uh, the only thing we've ever seen is our own period. So we just assume everyone bleeds like us. Right. <laughs> so if your right. per periods are super, super light and like you don't even fill a, a pad like the whole time or you wear panty liners and that's it or it's just two days, that is light. That's on the light side. And if you are filling, you know, a super pad every, you know, hour and a half all day, you know, for three days, that's too heavy. And so I think, um, and these are things that many of us don't really know. Um, so, okay, so I could go on about periods. The last thing I'll say about periods is that um, although it's very common to have pain, moderate to severe pain in pretty much any other circumstance except labor is not considered to be normal. And so even though it's, it's common and a lot of women experience pain, we should be aware that pain is a sign of inflammation. And for women that experience severe pain, it can be even a sign of a more serious condition like endometriosis. So we should not be thinking that this is just our lot in life as women. 
Um, so thank you. Yes. Thank you for saying that because I, I mean, I'm, I'm a word nerd. So I often, I think we've normalized menstrual pain. It's like, just pop the mitol, just pop the, you know, the Advil and have some coffee or whatever it is. Um, and I think that, you know, there's some cramping, like, I think that that would be considered, you know, within the spectrum of normal because you're, you, you know, you are having some contractions. There is, you know, there, we are getting rid of the endometrial lining, but if you are, um, you know, popping Percocets or you are, you know, you have to take a day off and, you know, you're not able to function in your everyday life. I think that we can, we can safely assume that you've crossed into abnormal. And it's well, and I'm, yes, I'm anti-pain. I just want to say, so I, you know, I have a lot of clients that will apologetically say like, oh, you know, I used, had to use the Advil and it's like, well, you need to do what you need to do when you're in pain pain. Um, mm -hmm. It's helpful to know that some of those, um, you know, NSAIDs, the non-steroidal um, inflammatory <laughs> drugs, uh, that they, you know, do have potential effects long term. But at the same time, I think the first step is to be aware. And there's some interesting research that I've looked at, you know, women who experience mild to or moderate to severe pain do when they measure their prostaglandin levels, prostaglandins, are uh, an inflammatory marker. They're a group of lipids that are responsible for those muscle contractions that we need in order to have a normal period. But women who have this intense pain tend to have upwards of four times the level. So I think the science is helpful for women because if, especially if, if you've ever been brushed off, I, I remember when I was young and I tried to explain my pain to my, my cousin and he told me that it like like I, I basically said, I was like, it feels like I'm in labor without a baby. And he was like, that's impossible. Basically shut up. Right. And so, no, no, it's real. And I found this really interesting research that showed that they actually measured the compressions of the, like they, they measured the contractions mm. in the uterus mm -hmm. and the, the, the women with severe period pain, the contractions were significantly higher than that of women in labor. So there's the science, right? Like, so now you have proof and evidence and this it's is not in your normal. head. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's not, not in normal. your head. Yeah. No, it's not in your head and it's not. So, um, so anyways, I think the first step is just to be aware of it and to know that there are ways that we can start addressing that inflammation and, and pain. Um, and so in terms of the actual cycle, so once you finished your period, um, you would enter into the preovulatory phase. So what's normal is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, after your period stops, and I should say the period should have a beginning, a middle and an end, and then it should be over and there shouldn't be all kinds of bleeding all throughout the cycle. Um, it, you know, some women may have a little tiny streak of spot or something like that around ovulation, but ultimately, if you're bleeding the whole time, this is a problem. And that warrants an investigation from a medical professional. So once your period is done, you should have some dry days and then anywhere from about two to seven days of cervical fluid. And so again, that's the, you know, lotiony stuff or the clear stretchy um, with at least one day where you see the clear stretchy stuff a few times, and that should lead to ovulation. So in a healthy cycle, as I mentioned, the range 24 to 35 days. So ovulation doesn't always happen on day 14. In a healthy cycle, it can happen, you know, as early as day 10, as late as day 22 or day 23. And so, you know, once you ovulate, the cervical mucus should dry up, you should go back to dry days. And then the period of time between ovulation and your period, if you're not pregnant, should be about 12 to 14 days. Um, so when you kind of go through all those parameters, it gives us a lot of things to look at to understand if your cycle is healthy. So kind of back to the vital sign concept. So if the length of the cycle is totally off, if you, your cycles range from 38 days to 45 days, well, that's more than the, the norm. And if you're ranging more than eight days from cycle to cycle, that is how we define a regular. And so there's specific issues that can um, contribute to that, you know, in the case of PCOS, that can be related to glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, metabolic type issues. And so, you know, it's helpful and that's not the only reason, but it's helpful to know that. And especially if you're seeing a pattern one, having one cycle that's a bit wonky is different to having a consistent pattern of cycle issues. That is what lends itself more to like, okay, there's something going on in here. There might be a condition. Um, so in addition to that, like if we look at the cervical fluid patterns, if you have no mucus ever, that is a problem. If you have some sort of, you know, mucus every single day, like you have lotiony stuff every single day. I mean, that can be a sign of a yeast infection or something else of that nature. Right. And then the, the luteal phase. So between ovulation and your period, again, 12 to 14 days is what we consider normal. So when you're trying to have a baby, 
if you ovulate and then you get your period seven days later, that's a, a problem because it takes about 12 to 14 days for implantation to finalize. So what, you know, there's the general health implications of charting, but then there's the fertility specific information where you can gather some specific information and details that can help you pinpoint if there really is something wrong with your cycle that could be preventing you from conceiving. I love that. That is so wonderful. And I want, I want to double click on ovulation just for a moment here. Cause I think, um, and this is my opinion. I don't know uh, if you might share this or not, but I think that we get, when we think about a woman's menstrual cycle, I think we get it wrong by nature of the nomenclature. So day one is the first day of your, of your period. That's by definition, the first day of your cycle. And I think that we often forget that the main point of your cycle is not to bleed. <laughs> you know, it's not, even though, you know, you're, as you just very eloquently explained, there's so much data that you can harvest from the, from your bleed week, from, you know, the length and the quality and the flow and the, uh, and the, vo- all of those things. But your ovulation, the releasing of the egg from the follicle is the main point of a female's reproductive cycle. And um, I want to talk, and I want to bridge this with, we've been kind of dancing around cervical mucus a little bit, and I just want to go right into it. Um, If I can, so if I can... uh, uh, summarize what you're saying and correct me here if I'm if I'm wrong. When we start to see that lotiony, egg whitey sort of substance, this is the this is an indication that you are is it that you are about to ovulate or that you have ovulated. What does that indicate? Well, it indicates that you're approaching ovulation. So when you are uh, in the pre-ovulatory phase, so your period is done. Um, then what happens, what's happening hormonally is that your ovaries are preparing to ovulate. And so specifically you have a number of follicles that start developing. And then one follicle is essentially chosen, which is the primordial follicle. The chosen goes, one. Yes. The chosen one. Yes. <laughs> and it goes on to develop. So only one, um, you know, typically we have two ovaries, so we could talk about fraternal twins if you want, but okay. So typically one is chosen. And so as that follicle is developing in the ovary, it is making all kinds of estrogen. And so our estrogen production um, comes from the ovaries in the preovulatory phase. And so as that estrogen is rising, and so it's, it's a really interesting thing to learn about because nothing is random. Um, you know, I, I often say to my clients, like, you know, I don't know if rabbits ovulate spontaneously in, you know, as a result of sexual arousal or something like that, because there's some myths around ovulation, like, right. if you get really horny, you're going to ovulate. So that's not true. We're not rabbits. So it's really interesting <laughs> because there's this whole um, uh, hormonal cycle that is taking place and we're essentially measuring the effects of it. So in a healthy cycle, your, your cervical fluid is actually kind of telling you what's happening with your hormones. As the estrogen rises, you see more. And as you get, so the estrogen rises to its peak shortly before ovulation. And it's that peak estrogen level that actually triggers ovulation. So it triggers our, you know, pituitary to release luteinizing hormone. Like if you want to go into all the hormones, we can, but um, basically that peak of estrogen is what triggers it. And so once, when the estrogen is quite high, that is typically when we're seeing the, the clear stretchy um, mucus in the largest quantities. So yes, to answer your question, it is essentially telling us that we are approaching ovulation. Um, The, the challenge is that um, with fertility awareness, the goal isn't to be able to you know, air quotes, predict ovulation, because ovulation is, is actually the most variable part of the cycle. And so that is why, you know, you can have a woman who's having some, you know, like PCOS type health issue where her cycle is maybe 60 days in a 60 day cycle, she's ovulating like day 48. So that's not healthy, wow. but my point yeah. is that yeah. ovulation is the most variable. Um, but that cervical fluid Um, the reason that we care so much about it is because it tells you when you're fertile. So if the sperm can live in there five days, then it's less about knowing exact day that I'm going to ovulate in advance. It's more about understanding that that's the significance of mucus. If you're trying to get pregnant and having sex when you see it. Right. And so we know that estrogen peaks, like it goes from like almost nothing in week one during your bleed week to, and I've seen in, in labs of some women, like it goes from, you know, call it 20 picograms per deciliter and it can shoot up to, I've seen it as high as like 500 or 600 picograms per deciliter. So it is a, a, it is a monumental rise 
um, in estrogen. And we see that peak a couple of days before, right. And then she has like a very sharp drop off. And then there's that sustained rise that we see again in, um, in the luteal phase with estrogen. So when you're seeing that creamy whiteness, you should see at least one day of that, that sort of sticky hand lotiony, uh, cervical fluid. And that is now a, 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 a physiological sign that you are about to release an egg. And as you mentioned, sperm can live up to six, five, six, seven days, uh, five in days. five days in, uh, I only say five because I know a lot of, like, there's a lot of, you know, I'm not saying that I have all the answers, but when I was looking at the research, you'd be hard pressed to find an actual study where the sperm lived longer than five days. Okay. And so the, the change in the alkalinity and the position, let's talk a little bit about what happens in the vagina, in the cervix, in the uterus around ovulation. So how does the position change? And then the change in the mucus, which we've defined, how does that allow for the sperm to get through? And then we can move into some of the dry days post ovulation and how that changes. All right. Well, so if you think about what we're not taught essentially about how our fertility works is that the majority of the time the vagina is actually acidic and our cervix is actually closed and so i like silly analogies and so my analogy is like a nightclub and so it's either the bouncer is out front and no one can get in or <laughs> uh, the bouncer is off duty and it's like a free-for-all and so essentially um in a so if i take you through the cycle again you know obviously during your period the cervix has to open a little bit to let the bleeding out but when your estrogen levels are low, what happens is that they're, you know, when they're too low to trigger um, uh, the estrogen production, that's when at the beginning of the cycle, you might see some dry days. Um, so you asked about the cervix and um, essentially, you know, the cervix is the base of the uterus. It's where the baby comes out. So when you hear someone say, okay, the cervix dilated to 10 centimeters, that is the cervix. And when, you know, it's a, an optional sign. So it's not something that you have to absolutely check because I know not every woman is comfortable checking her cervix. Uh, but if you do check your cervix every day for a full cycle, when you're ovulating, you'll find that during ovulation, the cervix is softer. It tends to be open. So if you've never had a baby before, it's not like open, like a door, it'll kind of feel like a dimple, um, but you'll be able to tell a difference between how it feels during the window and outside of the window. And um, so softer, typically open air quotes. So the dimple and then um, higher in position. And then after ovulation, under the influence of progesterone, so pr progesterone closes the cervix like physically. So you can feel the difference. It, it typically feels a lot firmer and it's in a different position. So it tends to feel lower. So quite literally you can feel the cervix, whether it's open or closed. And so this is uh, how the body works. Again, it's really fascinating. It's scientific, it's biological. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. So your uterus is an internal organ. <laughs> it, it, it's not just open all the time. That would open you up for bacterial infections and all kinds of problems. So mother nature is you know, infinitely smarter than us. And that is why our cervix, um, you know, and this whole, our, our reproductive capacity is limited to a certain time in the cycle. So outside of the fertile window, so, you know, before you start to see cervical fluid or after you ovulate, the cervix is actually closed. And as I mentioned, you can feel it. The vagina is acidic and, um, and that can be measured. Like you can buy a pH strip <laughs> if you want to even measure right. it. And so, uh, the, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, I think I mentioned before that when you're in your fertile window, it's like a home away from home, you know, the sperm. And so it's really interesting that a man's seminal fluid is an alkaline pH, and it is about the same pH as a woman's cervical fluid. So when I said home away from home, I was actually being literal. So when we're outside of the fertile window and the vagina is acidic and the cervix is closed, your body is a sperm killing machine. The sperm cannot survive they die within hours, if not minutes. And this is something, again, that is studied and can be studied. And outside of that window, so the cervix is closed and it's filled with a thick mucus plug. So you don't feel the plug or see the plug unless you kind of investigate under a microscope. There are plenty of people who have investigated it under a microscope. And so it's this thick, thick mesh that the sperm can't penetrate. So quite literally the bouncer is up front and- It's no like a diaphragm. Yeah, yeah. 
basically. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting because it's natural birth control in that sense. Like the, the sperm literally can't go anywhere. Right. So then back to the, it, so what happens in the window then? So as you approach ovulation, you start producing estrogen and you start to see cervical fluid. So some women will see the, the creamy, some women will see the clear. Uh, it, it's not always exactly the same. And I, as I mentioned, like two to seven days. So, you know, there's a difference in terms of how many days and the, the quality, but generally you'll see one of those options. Um, so what happens is that estrogen softens the cervix and it moves it into a different position. It opens the cervix. And if you were to look inside the cervix, so it's a little canal and inside the canal are these cervical crypts, we call them, they're essentially folds. And so it's in those folds in the cervix that the cervical fluid is produced. And if you want to get real technical, um, there's different crypts that produce different types of cervical fluid. So there are crypts that produce that mucus plug. So it's like, it, you don't see it when you have the mucus plug, it fills the cervix with a plug. And so you're seeing a dry day if you're charting. Um, under the influence of estrogen, that's when you see the actual cervical fluid. So the creamy, lotiony, or the clear, stretchy. And so you have these different crypts that make these different mucus that have different qualities. And so one of those qualities is to rapidly transport the sperm into the crypt. So it totally sounds like I'm talking about a sci-fi movie or something like that. <laughs> right. Like, but get in here, guys. <laughs> get in <But> here. Yeah. <laughs> there was um, a man named Dr. Eric Odeblad, and I think he passed away just recently. Um, but he studied cervical fluid for like 40 years. And there's a lot of really interesting research that he has put out. And obviously you can see the images of the, you know, looking at the mucus under the microscope and all those types of things. Uh, but essentially there's a type of mucus that has these ch channels. And so it rapidly draws the sperm inside the cervical crypts and then rapidly helps it to kind of get into the uterine cavity and fallopian tubes. And uh, studies have been done where they'll measure sperm in the fallopian tubes in minutes, right? Because this is, it's just such a fantastic and interesting phenomenon. Um, there's other aspects of the mucus. So other crypts that produce different kinds of mucus that actually screen abnormal sperm. So in case you didn't know this, even the healthiest man alive, about half of his sperm is not viable. Like even the healthiest man alive. Um, and scientists talk about how humans human males like why 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 is our sperm because there's plenty of animals in the animal kingdom who don't have like 90 percent of their sperm abnormal yeah. but human males are particularly so so this is a thing but also our bodies are equipped with this feature to screen the abnormal sperm mm -hmm. so um the mucus uh um i talk about it in the book it's l mucus uh, it has this quality of being uh, thick and viscous. So if the sperm is of poor motility, it can't swim through. And also um, it has these loaf like, so again, under the microscope structures that attach to abnormal sperm. So back to the uh, uh, sci-fi movie analogy. So they literally like attack the abnormally shaped sperm um, and prevent them from going through. And so, you know, one of the things I share with my clients in, in one of my classes are images of sperm. And so you think of sperm as like a round head and a tail, but if you look at what sperm actually looks like, the abnormal ones, they don't look like that. Like the heads morph, like the, when they talk about morphology, it means that the act, you can look at it and it doesn't look right. right. Like two heads, no head, no tail. So basically we have a screening mechanism built in and the only sperm that gets through for the most part are the normally shaped sperm. Um, so, I mean, this is why it's really interesting uh, to, to, you know, nerd out on cervical fluid. Uh, it really gives us an appreciation for the incredibly incredible bodies that we live in and the incredible things that it does. And I know plenty of medical professionals have, you know, looked at chapter three and they're like, how come I didn't know this? Like, right. this is so cool. This is so interesting. This is literally like a really huge clue into how life happens right like right um how our bodies how how essential cervical fluid is to natural conception and how the the crucial role it plays and also just to understand that when we don't have that fluid outside of the window right it's not possible you would think that this would be taught right why isn't it <laughs> I think it's actually what you were saying before. We're taught to fear our fertility, but we actually don't know anything about this. And I've had several conversations both online and offline around even just sensuality and female sexuality. Of course, that I think sometimes goes part and parcel with 
uh, our fertility. We are taught to, you know, uh, keep it together and people who enjoy their sexuality, they, there's all sorts of names and derogatory, uh, you know, connotations for that kind of woman who owns her sexuality. So I think that there's something, I mean, you know, you went through your, you know, you said post-feminist phase, I'm, I'm still there. So I think that, you know, we live in very much, <laughs> I still have not moved past that. You know, we are still very much living in a very toxic patriarchal society. So, you know, one of the ways that I think that that is facilitated is to, to elicit fear and misinformation. And, you know, I, again, maybe se separate and potentially offline, but I, you know, I think that there's uh, there's something to be said around, you know, making us fear our own bodies. I mean, there's so many, like I was talking to, um, one of my friends drew, he had posted something on Instagram and it was like, what's, what's one of the worst things, you know, you've ever heard about a woman's menstrual cycle. And for me, it was like, never, never trust anything that bleeds for five days and doesn't, doesn't die. die. Yeah. I've heard that many, you times. know, and it's like, go <laughs> F yourself. Do you know what I do? I built a new organ every month, bro. You know, yeah. like, Please. Yeah, try like giving, like creating light. Like my body, like yeah. I made ch food for my children in my Correct. sleep. Like Correct. I was sleeping, <laughs> and my body was fully stacking my breasts, full of life giving nourishment. Yes. What did you do today? Exactly, and my <laughs> breast milk can change based on what my baby needs. Like, please, it changes please. throughout. The, the breast milk of a newborn <laughs> is different to every month, and yes, and if you didn't know, now you know. It literally yeah. changes. Yeah. You have an underweight baby and you look at your breast milk, it's fat. It's hundred percent fat. They're trying to fatten up your breasts are trying to fatten up your, it's incredible. So, um, I love what you're saying. And I think that this might be a great place to move into infertility. Cause you mentioned something about male sperm. And I think that, um, you know, continuing this conversation around cervical mucus, I know that there's, there are changes as you were saying, as we age. So maybe we can touch on that. And then I'd love to talk about infertility. And I was saying this to you before we started, like, I really want to talk about infertility from a very balanced perspective. Cause I think that there is very much a tendency for when a couple is trying to get pregnant and it doesn't happen, we start blaming, or at least the woman will jump to there's something wrong with me because that's what we do as women. We're like, we must not be good enough. We are, our, our uterus must not know, you know, we must be, something is not working. I'm not taking some supplement. I'm not doing some diet regimen, what have you. Um, so let's, um, let's first start with how your cervical fluid or your, um, uh, uh, the, the physiological signs of ovulation change with age. And then let's, let's parse that with it, with the conversation around infertility and, and subfertility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's helpful to know that. I mean, there's a lot of negative, um, connotations around getting older, and uh, so I think it's helpful to know that our body does go through natural seasons, if you will. So um, when you are like, so for example, if you're in your late teens or early twenties and you're not on hormonal contraceptives, you would expect to have um, a, a cervical fluid pattern that would last a little longer. So you're just going to see more mucus. Like you, uh, typically a woman in their early twenties, this comes again from some of the research studies. And it's, again, it's kind of hard to find these days because most women are on hormonal contraceptives, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, young twenties, no contraceptives, healthy, uh, you would expect maybe closer to the seven day average where she's having plenty of days where she sees a lot of, um, like several times a day, she's seeing the clear stretchy for at least, you know, three or four of those days. And as you age, naturally, this, um, it, it, what happens is you have fewer days. So as you get older, you may notice in your 30s that instead of having like seven days or something like that, you may have four days. And so every woman is, isn't the same. So I'm not saying that everyone is, is exactly the same. But a woman in her early 40s typically doesn't have seven days of like, clear stretchy all day. Um, in my practice, women in their, you know, um, early to mid forties have fewer days. So I think that's something that's important to know. But with that said, uh, there's other issues that women face. So 30 years ago, we could have talked about that and that would have been just a normal thing, but you know, 80% of women probably weren't on hormonal contraceptives for 5, 10, 15, or 20 years. Yeah. So one of the effects of hormonal contraceptives is that it can, um, and certainly I've seen it uh, have a negative effect on cervical fluid, even if it's temporarily, but it certainly does. So when you first come off birth control, 
you know, some, there's a small percentage of women who don't have mucus at all for a couple cycles where they're actually ovulating. Um, and then for others, you know, maybe it takes them some time before they actually see the clear stretchy in significant quantities. And we could talk about, you know, why that is. Um, but certainly there's a lot of challenges. Um, also women who've gone through certain fertility treatments, certain fertility drugs, press, um, uh, cervical fluid production as well, like Clomid and, um, you know, tamoxifen is a breast cancer drug, but can also be used to, um, it's, uh, so these drugs uh, make your body resistant to estrogen. And so then you produce more and then you, you know, sometimes ovulate. And so it's interesting how some of these fertility drugs have come about. Um, but because they, some of them are making your body insensitive to estrogen, it's like they have this other effect of not like of okay. reducing your cervical fluid mm -hmm. production. All this is to say that, um, you know, cervical fluid production is important for fertility and there's a number of things that can affect it, whether it's your age and just the natural process of aging or whether it's, um, you know, different use of different um, hormonal drugs that have different effects on it. But I think what's really important, because when women really get into charting and they really start to geek out on cervical fluid, we can get to the place where it's like everything. And so if you're not making a lot, you can think that this is going to definitely be the thing that prevents me from conceiving. So what I always have to go back to is that pregnancy is possible in any cycle with ovulation. Like I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen with all the mucus not getting pregnant and I've seen women with basically no mucus getting pregnant. So um, cervical fluid is one of the important factors for conception. And I think that's what's really important. So from the most basic level, in order for success, successful conce conception to happen, you need to have, you know, healthy eggs, healthy sperm, healthy cervical fluid, and like a healthy body, you know, to and a healthy, you know, uterus, but a healthy body. Um, and you just, just in general good health to support the pregnancy. And so I think this touches, uh, gets into what you were wanting to talk about, because uh, we tend to, um, want to simplify it, you know, uh, and of course, because we're the ones that get pregnant, we're the ones that carry, we're the ones that show the evidence of this baby. Um, and so of course, and, and the medical system is really designed to put the onus on the woman as well. So when you think about fertility treatments and fertility clinics, the vast majority of those interventions are directed directly at the female. Right. Um, and so uh, there's certainly a tendency to think that, but again, when you go to the research and the science, you know, about 50% of the time, it's male factor <laughs> right, uh, right. that's playing a significant role. Literally, like about 50% of the time, it's not you or it's combined. And so uh, I think that's really, really important. Uh, I talk about that a lot um, on on my podcast and book and with my clients and everything like that, because um, because there are times when you, you know, your cycles, you're looking to see what's wrong with me. Um, but your cycles are pretty healthy and you're in pretty good health and it's something else. So it's, it, you remember what you said when you said, you know, you, you started trying and, and you tried that first month and you didn't get pregnant and you were shocked. So, I mean, imagine what it's like in my world where I see the charts and I see I've had clients where they have sex, like they have mucus, they have sex on those days and they've been doing this for years. So at some point you have to acknowledge that there's more going on here. Um, we have to have, I think, more reverence for this whole process of bringing life into the world. There's uh, some degree of, of mystery to it, right? Um, and then there's some degree of like check a sperm that we don't always do. <laughs> yes. I would love more of that. I would love more of that because I think that, I mean, even if we just think about the modern male, there is definitely, if you look at, and I've, and I've seen labs of uh, uh, you know, testosterone levels in, in men. And what we, what the literature is showing is that there is almost this estrogenization that is happening of our men where we are seeing less and less T and even just the, the lab ranges of what is considered normal now versus what was considered normal, a normal testosterone range for a male 10 years ago, 20 years ago, very, very different. Um, so I think that, um, you know, th there's a whole other conversation to be had around what is driving the low testosterone in these men, lifestyle interventions, chemical exposures, you know, sedentary lifestyle, nutritional choices, chronic stress, 
But I think it's also really important for the women and the men who are listening that it's not always her. Um, because she will, like you said, she's going to be taking the hormones and giving herself the shots and, you know, and, and doing all the things to try and get pregnant. And then it may actually not be her. Um, so how does, uh, do you, are you privy to any stats in terms of how infertility, um, changes? I mean, it, it changes with age. Of course we know that. Um, are you, are, are you familiar with any of the stats? Can you, um, rifle them off or, um, do we generally, do we know what happens to our fertility when we are, you know, 19 years old versus when we're 29 versus when we're 39 or 49? I mean, there's different ways to, um, answer that question, I suppose. Uh, one of the stats that came to mind is the one in six stat, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. So one in six couples face infertility. Um, I thought of something helpful to share in terms of what you were talking about with testosterone. And so again, like if you look at the research, so if you look at some studies that were done, like in the 40s, the average use had a sperm concentration of like 115, something like that, like over a hundred um, million, 100 million sperm per milliliter. And that was just like the average, like that was just, that's you pick a man off the street. <laughs> yeah. He's got a hundred million sperm. Right. Um, these days, if you pick a man off the street, um, the mm. average is close to about 50 million. Wow. And so that's yeah. like a 70%. I, I don't have the exact number, but it's a big drop. And I've, I've heard kind of tongue in cheek, you know, researchers say like, if sperm was an animal, we would consider it to be an endangered species. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, this is something where when I'm talking to my clients about this, I say, you know, it's not your partner. We're not singling out your partner. This is like a worldwide like yes. problem. Yes. And I mean, we see it in the animal kingdom where you have like fish that have the male parts and the female, like it's feminizing the fish. Right. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately uh, if you look at the world health organization, which is generally the, their parameters are generally used on the lab results. And so what the World Health Organization considers to be like a normal uh, level for sperm uh, is about 50 million. Or I'm trying to remember the exact number. I think that what they've listed for their lower bar in their 2010 document is like 20 million sperm oh, per wow. milliliter. So we go from like the 40s where the average man had 100. And now we're saying like if you have 20 million per milliliter or more, you're good. And then in terms of morphology, I believe their number is 4%. And again, what that means is that for every 100 sperm that your partner has, four of them have a normal shape and 96 of them, like no head, no tail, like no, like, so we're saying that's normal. And uh, one of the things I think is helpful to remember is that part of that low kind of bar for analysis is, um, you know, what is the baseline bottom that we need to do IVF. So it's not necessarily identifying what uh, has sci scientifically been shown to be optimal. I was right? going to say so that different. can't be a functionally optimal range that has to be minimum. Yeah, it's not a functional. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's more of that's what it is. So when you have, when you're working with someone who has, you know, they've had their sperm tested, what I hear all the time is like, yeah, my partner was tested and <laughs> they said it was fine. It's like the word I hate the most, fine, everything's fine. fine. And so then, but when you look at the numbers again, what is fine? Fine is the bar that's, you know, usually on the lab. And so, so it's just to say there's a difference between the bottom lower level that they're giving on the lab and what would be functionally optimal. And I pulled, you know, some studies and they do the research to, to determine at what level does this uh, start to impair your chances of conception per cycle. So um, like a normal healthy couple has about a 25% chance of conceiving. What that means is that it takes an average of four cycles to conceive, right. like when everything's great. Right. Yeah. And so when you're looking at like, okay, so at what point does it make that longer? So that's what they're looking at. And so those more functional numbers were about 50 million sperm per milliliter in terms of concentration, uh, almost 70, um, percent motility, which is a lot higher. I think their motility number is like 40%. And, um, and then in terms of morphology, it's closer to 15% morphology that is again, optimal. So to be clear, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, a man can't get his partner pregnant if he has low sperm, but for couples who have 
trying to conceive for a long time, it can mean that it would take longer because there is a challenge there. And so, you know, who's talking about that necessarily and who's um, there, there's different, like when a man has really low sperm, you, it, it, it's worth investigating. He should have a medical investigation to make sure there's nothing, you know, physiologically happening there. But from a functional perspective, there are plenty of specific scientific, um, you know, strategies, interventions, supplements, nutrients that have been shown to improve the you know, sperm quality, motility, morphology, all those things. And so, um, it, there's no kind of guarantees, but most people would want to know what they can do. So while the woman, like, if you're talking to a woman who's been trying to conceive for longer than a year, look at her supplement list. She's taking everything under the sun, you right. know? And, and I always say like, there's no man alive that's so healthy that he doesn't even need a multivitamin. So there comes a point where we should be looking at what he can do to improve his levels as well. And what are uh, some general, do you have any general recommendations that would be, so you just said a woman's taking an, everything under the sun, which is, I've definitely seen that to be true. Um, do you have recommendations in terms of B vitamins or zinc or magnesium? Like, are there, are there specific supplements or vitamins that you, or minerals that you would want to see either the woman taking, the man taking, both of them taking together? Well, I'll share that with, from my perspective, I think um, if like, first, if we're talking about the man and the sperm, if a man has really, really low sperm quality, you want to first start asking why. So right. it's kind of like um, you've got a splinter in your finger and you want to put like antibiotics over it. Like maybe before you put the antibiotics, you should take out the splinter. So like, you know, does he smoke a lot? Does he smoke pot? You know, those things don't mix. There's a lot of marijuana products now because it's legal where I live. And, um, you know, what effect does that have on sperm? There's a lot of research to show that it's not necessarily good for sperm. Um, is he a drinker? You know, does he eat? Is he in the sauna every day? Is he in the sauna? Yeah. Yeah. Does he take the hot, hot baths and all that yeah. kind of stuff? So yeah. um, you want to look at that. And also you had mentioned the estrogen exposure and things like that. Like, does yeah. he eat soy six times a week? You know, so I would say um, you want to, there are certain things. And again, if it's really low, have have them checked out. You know, you can take all the supplements if you have like a physical issue. So, you know, get the check by a doctor, <laughs> fertility specialist, make sure there's no structural problems, right? You know, because taking all these supplements, if there's a stru structural problem, you can appreciate. Um, and then also look at what's going on. Um, certainly right. when it's very, very low, uh, often there is a, a reason. Um, right. So that would be the, the step one. Um, now there's you know, several things that are known to support testosterone, sperm production. Um, vitamin A is essential. I talk a lot about liver. I have an ancestral approach, but yeah, there's a lot of research about vitamin A and I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, but you can think of vitamin A as the, and retinol, not beta carotene from carrots, like animal retinol from liver. <laughs> um, but so there's studies where they'll get, of course we're not animals. Yeah. Pardon? I said na liver is nature's multivitamin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but there's studies where, so, you know, we're not, you know, animals, but there's studies where they'll take, um, you know, male animals and give them an vitamin A deficient diet and they stop making just like their testosterone levels plummet and they stop making sperm. And then when they put it back, they start making sperm. So if most of us don't eat liver, um, or take cod liver oil or have like a significant source of retinol. So it's something to consider when you are in that stage of trying to make babies. And this goes for men and women. Um, uh, in the female studies, it's uh, animals that are deprived of vitamin A, they call it like fetal reabsorption. So they were just less prone to be able to have successful um, conception and to carry the babies to term. So that's something that's really important. So coenzyme Q10 is studied a lot. I know um, it, it's like the most popular supplement and but there's lots of good research behind it um, in terms of improving sperm morphology and motility <clears throat> and also um, egg quality and things like that um, and certainly you know B vitamins I would say just take some time to really uh, learn about the different antioxidants that support um, the reduction of sperm DNA damage um, antioxidants are also crucial it's, it's the it's kind of like that DNA damage on both sides it's kind of like a mirror image of what the men and women need to do in many respects um, optimizing your vitamin D levels for women um, making sure that they're not deficient in iodine people don't talk about iodine and that's crucial for normal ovulatory function and it's crucial for a crucial nutrient nutrient for um, fetal development and women who are deficient in iodine tend to have a harder time conceiving. So, um, so there's a lot of different nutrients that I could rattle off, but I think those 
are a good place to start. Good place to start. And just on the topic of iodine, one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was autoimmunity and, uh, and infertility as well. And when we think about this specifically in the context of, in the context of females, we tend to see autoimmune, uh, disorders at a, you know, orders of magnitude higher in the female population than we typically see, uh, in the male population. And specifically, I tend to see Hashimoto's or issues with the thyroid. Uh, and I also see a lot of MS, um, and I think that, you know, when you sort of look, you know, geographically where we see MS, it's like the further away from the equator you are. And I'm in, I'm in Toronto. Uh, so MS is not an uncommon um, thing, um, uh, particularly at my, you know, latitude, if you will. So how does, um, how does autoimmunity, and we can talk about this, I know that each individual disease and disorder has its own, you know, pathways and their own, and, and their own mechanisms, but in specifically with Hashimoto's, because a lot of women, we see hypothyroid function and it's almost always when the thyroid is, has gone kaput that we, t we tend, we will start to see these autoantibodies being produced. What is the, um, what are some of the challenges with someone with Hashimoto's or hypoactive thyroid and her ability to conceive? I mean, that's a, a complex question. And I would say that for women with Hashimoto's, I think some of the same investigations need to take place um, that don't always take place. So uh, I also live, I live outside of Toronto. And so uh, in Canada, you have to pay for a vitamin D test. <laughs> yeah. Um, unless your doctor recommends it, you know, so they don't even look for certain things. Um, so it's interesting because women have thyroid conditions at a rate that's alarmingly high compared to men. I, I believe it's like eight to 10, 10 to one, like it's something ridiculous, like yeah. that orders of magnitude. Um, now there's a lot of controversy regarding, you know, iodine and different nutrients and how it affects the thyroid. And so certainly there's a lot of professionals that just outright say across the board that if someone has a thyroid issue, they should never take iodine. Um, and I would say that uh, if you look at the research, if they do spot urine testing, for iodine, it is women of reproductive age and women who have had children, so postpartum, uh, who are always the lowest. And there's certainly an argument to be made that women need a different level of, of iodine than men. Um, so women, in addition to thyroid, so our ovaries have the second highest concentration of iodine and iodine is required for the maintenance um, of normal breast tissue. And uh, certainly pregnancy, multiple pregnancies put a, a drain on all of our nutrient function. So when it comes to, to maintaining optimal thyroid function, there are a number of key nutrients that are required to sustain that, you know, including magnesium and iron and zinc in particular, yeah. and a, a deficiency in, you know, any of those areas, iron, zinc, iodine, um, can certainly dysregulate the body temperature. And so I think there's a tendency uh, to, you know, if a woman has antibodies to just go to this, um, I would say it's a bit of a dogmatic approach without, so my big, like you can tell I have a beef here. So my beef <laughs> is that, um, so for example, if a doc, like if a functional doctor has a practice, they're not gonna have a blanket recommendation that every single client should take this much vitamin D. They're actually like, if they're worth their salt, gonna, you know, at times test the D and then, you know, prescribe a certain amount and then test them in a couple of months to make sure that they're getting an adequate amount that is for them. And iodine is one of those areas where most practitioners don't test. They have their opinions and their viewpoints about it right. philosophically, and then that's it. And so, you know, what I see is, you know, I, I, I'll sometimes recommend if I see sign, signs of iodine deficiency. So at times, I mean, there was a time when people thought that um, hypothyroid was a sign of iodine deficiency, but of course now the, the standard is like, no, it's not because of that, because we have iodized salt. So no, we're good. Um, but there was a time when that was considered. And then, so other signs, just in case you're curious, are, you know, fibrocystic, dense breasts, sore and tender breasts, cystic tissue, like ovarian cysts. Um, there's certain signs and symptoms of iodine deficiency that are not necessarily 
I'm not sure if it's well known or whatever the case, but certainly, you know, I've never sent like a postpartum client for an iodine test and like had her come back totally great. <laughs> so um, I guess you could see my point is that women, um, Hashimoto's and, and women that are struggling with thyroid issues. So um, I'll kind of backtrack a little bit. One of the challenge, like one of the things that happens with charting. So obviously with charting, we talked about the three main signs. We talked about the mucus and the temperature and the basal body position. So when you start charting, and you start taking your temperature every day and putting it on a chart. If your temperature is low, it definitely stands out. Like I made a charting book and purposely uh, put like a 97.0 at the bottom. And so if your if your temperature is like 96.5 every day, it doesn't even go on the chart. So charting can bring this stuff to your attention. And there's a tendency to just assume that it's like, oh, my temperature is low, I must have hypothyroid. So there's this tendency to kind of, um, to jump to that. And so I guess the only message that I want to send is that there, you know, this is an issue that plenty of women face. And I would say that for many, it's not necessarily fully investigated. There are plenty of um, factors that contribute to uh, a consistent low temperature, um, not the least of which is not eating enough food, like skipping breakfast every day and not eating enough food right. <laughs> right. cause you to have. So right. there's a lot of things that like, like need to be investigated in these women, because if your temperature is not, if it's too low, like it's a sign of your metabolism. If your metabolism is too low, it does make it harder to conceive. Um, if your thyroid is off, it's, it's crucial. If you become pregnant with a thyroid that is off, it significantly um, increases your risk of miscarriage and pregnancy complications. And so um, it's really, I think really important that we're looking at the holistic perspective instead of being so stuck on the diagnosis, like investigate her, see if she has low iodine, make sure she's got her zinc is good. Her, I, her iron is good. Make sure that she's um, uh, preparing for pregnancy uh, nutrient wise. And, you know, let's get her temperature regulated because until that temperature is regulated and her thyroid results are in the normal range, uh, it's, it's just going to be more challenging. Yeah. And I, I echo that. I think that, um, what I've seen typically is sort of multi-parous women, women who've had like two or more pregnancies, um, for whatever reason, the thyroid does tend to, uh, go kaput. <laughs> and does uh, anyone check like, and this no. is why, like, the, like no one checks her iodine. Yeah. And like, I, you may start to notice as well, like there's a lot of women that have had multiple kids that are like getting breast cancer in their forties. And again, like, is anyone talking about the link between low iodine and fibrocystic breast disease and dense breast? Um, uh, so for anyone who's really curious about this, my go-to resource is a book by Dr. David Brownstein called Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. You know, he talks about it. And frankly, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about it, but if, if any practitioners are listening, like if you have a client that has like fibrocystic breast disease, test her iodine and see for yourself. Right. And I will make sure that that's in our show notes um, as well for, for our listeners. We actually do have quite a few clinicians that, uh, that tune in for this podcast. Lisa, you have been, this has just been a masterclass in fertility and I have just had the best time nerding out with you. So why don't you um, like plug all of the things? So I know you have a podcast, you have a book, um, you're teaching classes, you have clients, where can people find you if they want to interact with you more, find out more about your work and engage with you? Well, thank you so much. This has been super fun. Um, so everything that we talked about today, believe it or not, is a book. So the book is the fifth idol side, uh, Master Cycles Optimize Your Fertility. And, and that's why I wrote it. And um, if, if you've never heard of it before, I put like a thousand citations in the back because for me, it's not about me saying like, I know everything. I, it, I don't. But what I do is I do my best to do my research and make that accessible. So for all the like practitioners, all those who want to nerd out the just women who are like, I want to understand this, or if you're thinking about switching to a method like this, and you don't necessarily feel confident talking to your healthcare provider, it's really helpful to know where this data comes from. And so anyways, that was my intention with the book. Um, I do teach classes, like I have group classes for women who want to learn charting and who want to understand that connection between their cycles and their overall health. And I've recently launched uh, a new program to train practitioners because over the years now, like the more, um, what I'm hearing the most kind of from my audience is like, where do I go to learn this? How do I teach my clients? And so I'm basically teaching what, what I know. And so all of that, um, you can find information at my website, fertilityfriday.com. 
fertilityfriday.com. And you also have a podcast as well. I do. So the Fertility Friday podcast. So if you search Fertility Friday in any of your favorite podcast players, you'll find me. And so I'm in your seven, I think. Nice. There's a lot of podcasts. I think I'm releasing episode 350 this week. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. That is amazing. Okay. So I will make sure that we have all of these links um, in the show notes. Lisa, it's been a pleasure talking to you and you did not disappoint. I said at the beginning of this hour, you are like the best in the world. You, you hold the title. You still hold the championship, the, the championship belt. So thank you so much for your presence and for just the information you dropped today. I know this can be really, really useful to, uh, to our listeners. Thank you. Dr. Stephen Gundry is the video that's coming up next for you. Just click right here. We're talking about the microbiome, energy, postbiotics, mitochondria, and how to get your energy back. Continuous ketosis, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year is really dumb. 